Beth Lima, Director of Collections at the Buffalo Museum of Science. And today we're continuing our virtual tour of the museum by looking at one of our exhibit halls, Biodiversity. Biodiversity is life. It is the very essence of, every, of life on Earth. And in 2015, we took our old and outdated Hall of Vertebrate Zoology and completely renovated it into our Biodiversity Science Studio. So, let's spend some time today exploring what that means here at the Buffalo Museum of Science. So, rather than focus on an animal class like vertebrates, we wanted to show our collection in context. What can our collection tell us about life on Earth? So we looked at biomes. We looked at different life groups where certain flora and fauna interact with each other. And we chose the rainforest biome, the savanna biome, and the tundra or the arctic biome. So first let's explore the rainforest here at the Buffalo Museum of Science. So instead of focusing specifically on the uh, taxonomy of the specimens, we look at all the different variation of life in the rainforest. We have examples of invertebrates here on the back wall. You can see a large variety of the insect species that call the rainforest home. We focused here on the, the South American rainforest or the Andean rainforest because that's the strength of our collection. In the 1980s, we sponsored a um, field exposition to the Andean rainforest uh, called the uh, Cohen Expedition, and most of the specimens that you see, uh, most of the invertebrate specimens that you see here were collected by the Cohen family as part of that um, sponsored expedition. Then in the back there, we have the spectacle bear. The spectacle bear is the only bear species that calls Central and South America home. And what's interesting when you're looking at um, our collections, I always ask visitors, why do you think something has that name? Where did it get its name? Well, it doesn't take a major science degree to know where the spectacle bear got its name. He's literally named for the white uh, around his eyes that makes it look like he's wearing spectacles. So that's kind of fun. And we're moving on. Um, there are uh, five primate species that call um, Central and South America home. Here we have uh, two. Uh, up here um, is the capuchin monkey, which I always like because I'm a huge fan of the movie Night at the Museum. And the capuchin, <laughs> the capuchin monkey has a great um, role to play in that exhibition. Also back here we have um, a three-toed sloth. Sloths are gaining in popularity right now, um, but they are just fascinating creatures when you think that they live most of their life in that position, hanging upside down. They only come down from the tree canopy maybe once a week, um, and that's to uh, actually to defecate, which they only do weekly. Um, because everything about them, even the digestive system, is slowed down. Also in the rainforest you have capybara, uh, the world's largest rodent. He's most close, he looks kind of like a, a pig or some kind of wart, but he, warthog, but he's actually most closely related to the guinea pig, which apparently is one of the top five most popular pets in the U.S. Not the capybara size though, the guinea pig size. Then we have a giant anteater. An anteater can eat up to 30,000 ants in a day. That's an insane amount of ants. Um, and to think that you have to find that volume of ants every single day. So the rainforest is just a wash with a variety of flora and fauna, both mammals, invertebrates, birds. Um, and then we move, contrasting with the South American rainforest, we move to a completely different region of the earth here we're talking about the African savanna. And the first thing I think you notice when traveling from the rainforest to the savanna is just the coloration of um, the animals that are found in this region, which is another example of adaptation. These animals are, do not have cloud cover. They do not have um, the forest canopy to protect them. So they're adapted to a way of life on a very barren landscape. The African savanna only has two seasons a year, the wet season and the dry season. And so all of these animals are adapted for life in that harsh environment. 
The cheetah, of course, is a case study in uh, genetic biodiversity. Every aspect of the cheetah is for hunting and for speed. And cheetahs have been used as a model when we talk about biomimicry and the way that um, manufacturing uses things to move. They look to the animal kingdom. They look to life on earth for inspiration. And the cheetah has been used in, in that way. Of course, next to the cheetah, we have the ocelot. So a lot of large cats um, are found um, on the African savanna. The, the ocelot is, instead of chasing down an animal for speed like the cheetah does, the ocelot leaps on its prey. So instead of um, being sort of genetically engineered for speed, its height and its movement and its hunting is done by sort of leaping. We do, of course, have the large cats that you expect to see on the African savanna. Uh, we have a lion and um, next to him a lioness. Um, and one of, uh, when we're talking about biodiversity and we're talking about biomes, we're talking about the places that animals call home or where they're adapted to. So one of the things we put in this exhibit that's kind of fun is a quote from Pumbaa of The Lion King, there he is on the wall, where he says in um, the movie, home is wherever you rest your rump. So these particular animals rest their rump in the African savanna. So we move from the African savanna, the arid desert region of the African savanna, into the environment of the uh, Arctic. We have snow covered, uh, ice melting, and these particular animals call that Arctic region home. So bears are still wild in the Arctic. It is estimated that specifically for, for grizzly and um, Alaskan brown bears that 98% of the bear population has been reduced in the lower 48 states. So now really the entire wild population of large bears is found in Alaska and in the Arctic region. Even though greatly reduced, it is the only area where you're still going to find these large bears um, in their natural habitat. So a lot of it, when we're talking about the Arctic region, we're talking about climate change. And nowhere is there a larger poster child for, for climate change than the polar bear. And we have our polar bear here um, with his, uh, his bear friends to greet us and to tell us about uh, climate change here in um, North America. Just as um, a curatorial aside, this particular brown bear here um, has been in the museum's collection for a very long time, although not um, on exhibit. But for those of you who are movie buffs, you may be familiar with this particular brown bear. He was actually starred alongside Robert Redford in The Natural. We have a lot, our collections are so varied. We have our specimens that teach us about life on Earth, but then Alongside it, we have movie stars, so that's kind of fun. The other thing that we tried to do with the biodiversity exhibit is not just show the flora and fauna of a region, but look across our collections. And so in this particular section, we have a portion of our anthropology collection talking about traditional ecological knowledge. So how the indigenous populations of a particular region or one of those biomes uses the natural environment. And nowhere is that um, more prevalent than in the traditional um, cultures of the Arctic region. And so this is just some of the material that is, uses the flora and fauna of the region um, in the material culture. The um, cape or um, parka that you see there, the jacket, the rain jacket, is actually made from uh, seal intestines, which is extremely waterproof and keeps the um, fishermen safe as they're hunting in the Arctic waters. We also have um, on, the, on the wall here, when we're talking about naming things and how things get their name, what is the difference between a reindeer and a caribou? Um, it's just how what you grow up and, and how you grow up naming things, which is kind of interesting. You could also, similar to what we saw in the African savanna, the coloring of these animals changes. 
you in the Arctic, of course, you have snow. So in order to survive in a snowy environment, your fur changes according to, or your covering changes according to um, the season. So the, these birds here are probably the most, um, you can see the winter plumage and the summer plumage. The specimens in the back, they're the same, they're, they're all ptarmigans, they're the same species, but their plumage changes according to the seasonality, again, to protect them from predation. So the oceans cover about 70% of our planet. So of course, life in the ocean or on the coast is a significant biome that we have to draw attention to. So here we're, on, we're in our life on the coast area of biodiversity and we have here the California sea lion. And he, this particular um, specimen is from the coast of North America. Behind him here you see some narwhal, well we call them narwhal tusks, but we, they're not in fact tusks in the sense of sort of an elephant tusk. A narwhal tusk is actually a sensory organ. Um, the male canine grows and uh, most scientists believe that this, the, the narwhal tooth or narwhal tusk is not in fact used purely as a defense mechanism but as a sensory organ. It's how they navigate um, through the oceans. Um, and so we have um, some of the narwhal tusks here in our collection. The blue whale, ours is um, a uh, model of a blue whale. We don't have a taxidermy specimen in our collection. Um, but of course the blue whale is one of the largest living animals and uh, believed to be one of the heaviest. He's quite magnificent out there. And then, but the thing with life on the coast is it's not just about um, the mammals and birds, but also the, all the invertebrates that call the ocean home. This is just a small representative sample of specimens from our collection showing corals and kelp and shells. Um, we have uh, the more common uh, sand dollars, a large portion of our collection um, is not on exhibit, so we try and illustrate with representative samples where possible. You may not think of insects um, near life on the coast, but of course there are a variety of, sort of dragonfly species that would be found um, in a marine ecosystem. So when we did our major renovations and we changed our side halls into these interactive science studios where we have our collections and completely changed our context, we also recognized that some of our um, collections are just beloved and nobody want, and, and people want to remember them the way they always were. So each one of our science studios has what I sort of call these, these throwbacks to the original installations. So this, this diorama, the bison diorama, is original to this side hall. So we would have been in the Hall of Vertebrates um, that was originally installed shortly after the museum opened in the 1930s. And the bison group actually um, has a longer history with the Buffalo Society of Natural Sciences than this building. Several of these mounts were actually in our one of our original homes when the museum was at the Buffalo Central Library down, downtown on Lafayette Square. Also, the mounts were so well done in the 1890s um, by a preparator by the name of Joseph Santens that Santens sent two cows and a calf to Atlanta, Georgia in 1895 as part of the exposition there. So they are well-traveled bisons, but then were, um, additional specimens were added and they were installed in this, what we call a diorama um, in the 1930s. And a diorama is sort of part science and part art because the idea being that the bison mounts are placed in a context, they're placed in a habitat with all their flora and fauna. So you can really look at a diorama and it's not just about the bisons, but about the prairie dogs and the snakes 
and all the other small, tiny details that maybe you don't realize the first time you see this particular installation, you may not pick out all the components. Um, so this is, this is sort of one of the uh, beloved exhibits uh, at the museum. When we renovated biodiversity, we were able to spend um, to do some conservation on the diorama. Some of the uh, background painting had um, cracked over time, so conservators went in, all the specimens were cleaned, and we changed the lighting system. Um, so now, um, hopefully, they will remain here on Humboldt Parkway um, for another 90 years of enjoyment. So biodiversity is just one of our many uh, science studios here at the Buffalo Museum of Science but it also illustrates just a small portion of our collection. And when we put together this particular exhibit, the idea is that the biomes that we saw today, they can change over time. So we have a rainforest from South America. We could change that to be life in the Adirondacks. We could change the Arctic region to be um, life in um, a city. You know, what kind of animals populate a city environment? And so the idea behind our exhibitions is that they support our collections and that they allow us to move through over 750,000 objects in our collection. And so although today you see these um, biomes, over time they will change to encourage people to come back to the museum to see more, but also to share our vast collection with a greater audience. So in here you have our vertebrate zoology collection, our invertebrates, we saw some items from our anthropology collection, um, but it's key to this, the society's history. We've always collected in those areas and although the exhibitions hall may change, we just have such a great resource here at the Buffalo Museum of Science to pull from and to share science and our natural world with the community.